Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve sallallahu ve sellem ve barak ala seyyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. Alright, so now we're going to turn the page inshallah and go back to our fiqh class. I know that it's been a while, like you know, obviously with being out with the heart attack and everything for a couple of months. So you can go and review all of the past, um, I think this is actually the 13th session now. So you can go back and review all the others. They're all up on YouTube um, uh, with the notes and everything. So inshallah, you should be able to go and view uh, all of those. So in this chapter, we're going to go over the uh, the chapter, Bab al-Salat al-Marid wa al-Musafir. We've been going over the chapter as it related to people when they're sick and people when they're traveling. And the reason why uh, Sheikh al-Majaji puts these together uh, is because what is the, the, the marid and the musafir? They're going to be the, the person of rukhsa. They're a person that's looking for some type of dispensation uh, or an alleviating uh, of something difficult. And so that's why um, these two are kind of put together uh, in combination. So as it relates to the travelers, al-musafir, man kharja min baladi, right, the one who leaves his place or his country or his residence. Balad doesn't also just mean, doesn't just mean like a country. We tend to think of that in the modern context, like America is a balad and and Canada is a balad. La uqsimu bihad al-balad wa anta hallum fi had al-balad, right, where the, Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran about the Prophet that you are safe in this balad. What is it about Mecca? You're safe in this place, right, of Mecca. It's a person that leaves where they're from, so to speak. So, man kharja min baladihi iqamatuhu ila balad akhir. So, a person that goes from one place where they're a resident to a place where they are not a resident. Now, that's not the totality of it, but that's the, that's part of it. What? La ahla lahu bihi. Of where they have no family in that place. Where they have no family in that place. Yab'adu an baladihi sanata ashar farsakhan. And so, in order to qualify as, as a traveler, you leave your place where you are a resident to where you are no longer a resident, where you have no relatives in the place that you're going to, and its distance is at least what? Sittata ashara farsakhan. Sorry, sittata ashara farsakhan. It is at least 16 measurements known as a farsakh, which is, he said, what? Uh, it's فَأَكْثَرْ uh, فَيُسَاوِي ثَمَانِينَ كِلُمَتَرَ تَقْرِيبًا It's around 80 kilometers, which is about maybe, what, 55, 60 miles? I think if you convert the kilometers to, or maybe 45, 50, I'm not really good at kilometers, but um, somebody can do the math really quick. 49, right, so 40, about 50 miles. So, so تَقْرِيبًا, right, approximately 50 miles. So those together, it's not just the distance, but that you are leaving where you're considered a resident of one place to where you're no longer a resident there and you don't have any family there and it's that distance. So there are some people that, like here, if they were to go from, say, San Bernardino all the way out to, say, Malibu, right, using a California reference. So from San Bernardino to Malibu, I would estimate to be a good, what, 75 miles, right? So, but the question is, are you still in the same ballad? That's the argument, right? So some would say, well, you know, it, it qualifies because of the distance, yes, but that's not the totality of the qualifier. The qualifier is the distance, but also that you're leaving a place where you're, it's not your same ballad, your same residence, so to speak, and that you don't have any family there. Now, okay, if you go from San Bernardino all the way out to Malibu, and you don't have any family there, okay, you can check that box, and it's over 50 miles, you can check that box. But can you really say that you are not a resident there? Because, as we will see, can you also not just, you can go back home, like, basically in the same day. So we'll see there's many more qualifiers that problematize just simply saying, oh, I'm going from San Bernardino out to Malibu, I praise traveler, right? Now, there are other schools of thought on this, uh, other madhahab, uh, and I'm not saying uh, that uh, you, you, you could not pray traveler, but according to the school of Medina, it's not as simple as that. There are some other things to consider. So, 
أن مصافة القصر هي مصافة محددة بمصيرة يومين متعددين أو يوم وليلة. So for instance, know that the distance for shortening the prayer, the qasr, is defined as the distance covered in two moderate days of travel or one day and a night. So again, going from San Bernardino to Malibu, it's not two days, it's not even a day and a night. You can get there in two hours. Does that qualify really as traveler? Again, this is something that, again, according to the Maliki school, perhaps not. <laughs> no, and that's true. Now, if you're walking, if you're walking from San Bernardino to Malibu or on the back of a donkey, then yeah, it probably actually would take you a day and a night to get there. So that's what I'm saying. Like if you're in a car and you can get there an hour and a half, two hours, then... Right, that's what I'm saying. There's so many different aspects that have to be considered, including the method of travel. So not just the distance, but how are you getting to, because yeah, walking 75 miles, or even on the back of a horse 75 miles, and you know, in your truck or your car 75 miles at 90 miles an hour going down the 210, and the 134, right, is a whole different story. Beside the Ibn Hamala al المسافرين. So in, by the travel of camels carrying the burdens of travelers, right? The journey for each day equals a a, 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 a stage or what they considered like a, a, where you might stop and pause for rest, right? And so again, traveling by camel, how many of us are traveling by camel? Very few. Now, I mean, I'm not saying this doesn't exist anywhere, but for us in the modern context, Obviously, we're traveling at a much faster rate of travel. The journey of each day equals a stage, and the distance for shortening the prayer is two stages. Marhalatani. Right? And then each stage is equal to two barid. Wal marhala baridani. So this barid is a type of measurement. And then wakul barid, every, each barid is either two, equal to what? Arbatu farasikh equal to four uh, farsakh. And we said about the farsakh, right? It is equal to, well, each farsakh is going to equal like about three miles, I think somewhere in there or uh, approximately. So he says, what well, farsakh, thalatha amyal, wal mil dhira, right? So every, every mile, is roughly to be considered about 3,500 cubits or dhira, and but then there's some disagreement. Some say actually no, every mile is equal to what alfain uh, dhira. Uh, it's equal to 2,000. So there's in these measurements, there's not 100% agreement upon upon what they always are, uh, and so the main things we're going to focus on are method of travel, the distance, whether you are really leaving your ballad and whether you are a resident or not, and if you have family in that place. Dalil al-Khal mu'atamid, and so the evidence for the accepted and the relied upon view is from the hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, لا يحل لامرأة تؤمن بالله ويوم الآخر تسافر مصيرة يوم وليلة إلى إلى معذي محرم منها. So the Prophet Sallallahu gave a prohibition, said that it is not halal, it is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah and the last day to travel more than a day and a night without being accompanied by somebody that is considered محرم, either her husband or a family member in some way right but alone more than that no now i know this happens a lot but this is something that should be taken into consideration obviously because this is what the prophet said La this is, is not permissible and so i think now we become very casual about it you know people traveling uh, alone and, and without family um Something again to, to consider. Well, what should Dalil minhu? And so the reasoning behind the evidence. And then Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam sama qat hadhihi al-musafaza safran. That's because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam referred to traveling this distance as a journey. He would wa harma ala ala al-mara. He prohibited the woman wa qat ha min ghairi suhba zawji wa la mahram. That he prohibited her without doing so without writing either her husband or again 
than somebody that's mahram for her family. فَدَلَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ خُرُوجِهَا فِي دُونَ الْمَسَافَةَ الْمَذْكُورَةِ And this indicates that if, the, if she travels a distance less than this uh, without the, the, the presence of her husband or her family or the mahram, then it is permissible for her to do so. Uh, for instance, مُبَاح لَهَا غَيْرَ مَحْرَمْ عَلَيْهَا فَكَانَ ذَلِكَ فِي حُكْمِ خُرُوجِهَا فِي حَوَائِجِهَا إِلَى السُّوقِ Right? وَلَمْ يَكُنْ سَفْرًا So like if she goes out to the store or does things like to go to the market or whatever, there's, no, there's, there's no problem with this. Uh, it would depend on whether any of the male children would be considered of the age of responsibility. So if she's traveling with a baby, you know, and again, the, these things are taken with, now let's say you have somebody that's in an emergency situation, you know, a life-threatening situation, or there's some type of emergency and the woman has to travel. Okay, I mean, we don't say this person's like a calf or something, right? It's just the Prophet ﷺ forbade this generally as something to do casually. Some, there can always be, look, you know, if you're dying in the middle of the, 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 the ocean and you're on a desert island, you can have a ham sandwich to preserve your life. Right, so these things taken within some context, but again, just casually, you know, we we have to accept the authority of the Prophet Sallam. <laughs> and because the journey of a day and a night equals a full day's journey, it is known from their travels that they would travel at night and rest during the day. <laughs> they would take a qailula. They would take a small rest during the day. What we often think of is like you have to constantly be state in a state of moving. No. Part of that could also include resting during that travel as well. All of this is going to ultimately get to what is it that what is it that you can do as the traveler? You can shorten the prayer and you can combine them. So if you have let's say you set off and you're going to travel from here to Santa Barbara. Okay, you're definitely not a resident of Santa Barbara or San Francisco, right? Which you can, you know, you're, you're not a resident there. You can't get there easily uh, in there and back in the same day. There is a difference of opinion. If you make the intention and you set out and you're going to cover that distance, but you're going to stop along the way and have a rest, then this is what he's saying. But if you're, if you're not quite sure, like you're just leaving the house, I'm not sure if I'm going to go all the way up there or not, like that, then no, you don't do that until you have covered at least some of those qualifiers, like the distance or something like that. And then you could begin to shorten the prayer. And so he said that, uh, this is the meaning of the traveler, right? A full's a full day's journey does not allow someone to leave their home uh, and return on the same day. So, like, to, if you go there and, and come back on the same day, then you're not really traveling because you're gonna within the within either the day or the night you're going to rest in your own home sleep in your own home, even if you covered a great amount of distance, then you're not really considered a traveler. So imagine, and you could do this, imagine you took a flight from Ontario airport to San Francisco, and you dropped off a package, and you come back. You could, I mean, you can reasonably do this in the same day. Then, according to some, you would not be a traveler. And so you would not shorten your prayers, you would not combine your prayers, and, and such. Of course, there's differences of opinion of understanding this. Some would say, no, you've obviously left you know, you've left your you've left your residence. There's no family. No, I don't have any. You know, or, or I do, but let's say you don't have any family there. You've traveled the sufficient amount of mileage. Uh, again, these are things that they're going to be differences of opinion. But he's just giving you the relied upon opinion, right? In the madhab, he says, فَيُسَنُّ لَهُ قَصْرَ الصَّلَوَاتِ الرَّابِعِيَةِ إلَى نَصْفِهَا مِنْ حِينِ خُرُوجِهَا مِنْ مِنْ بَلَدِهِ حَتَّى يَعُودَ إلَيْهَا so it is recommended as a sunnah for him to shorten the four unit prayers, right? So we're talking about Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha. Those are the only ones we pray with four raka'ah. So it is a sunnah, which means not wajib. It's important to remember. It's not wajib, but it is a sunnah. It's highly recommended for the individual to shorten those longer prayers from four to half, right, to two, in the time that right fa inna dakhala baladihi wa alayhi salatun rabi'atun kharaja wa waqtaha wa lam yusalliha fa qadaha maqsura and this is and this is actually this is one of the important takeaways that i want people to understand if a person let's say you travel you travel some far distance and you've you're, you're already shortening your prayers and combining your prayers and whatnot and you land at LAX or you land at Ontario right you live here in Upland and you land in Ontario so okay i'm back 
back in my I'm back in my hometown now, so I'm done traveling. What do I do? Because maybe on my flight coming in, let's say I landed and I still haven't prayed Maghrib and Isha, which I know I can combine and I can shorten Isha from four to two. So I've done my travel. I land at Ontario Airport. I have not yet prayed Maghrib and Isha. What do I do? So he says, if that person enters their city and still has a four unit prayer, not just Maghrib, but Maghrib and Isha, right? So they have a four unit prayer that its time has passed. So he says that what? So the time for, or maybe a better example would be like Dhuhr and Asr. So let's say you land, the time of Dhuhr has already passed. And now it's the time of Asr. So Dhuhr is already gone because you had the intention of Ta'khir. I'm going to delay my Dhuhr and Asr, but oh man, I'm already back. So now what do I do? Do I pray the prayer late? You know, meaning like I'm at fault here? Or like, what do I do? Like, what, what's the scenario? So if you enter your place of residence, your city, and you still have an outstanding four unit prayer that's time has passed and you have not prayed it yet. So you haven't prayed Dhuhr, it's now the time for Asr, then you should still shorten it. Uh, uh, you know, Faqadaha, uh, right? Maqsura. So therefore you should shorten it if it's passed. If you land and it's at the time of Dhuhr and you're now in your place of residence and it's and it's in the time of Dhuhr, then you go ahead and pray it like normal and you don't shorten and you no longer combine. And so your, your Rukhsa, your dispensation, or traveling is over. So that's important, right? So, because sometimes people get confused about that, right? And so this particular relates to as salawat ar right? For the, the prayers of which there are four units. Even though you can combine, right? Because what we're dealing with now is qasr, the shortening of the prayer. Jama' is, is a second thing to consider. So that's what you would do if you are traveling and you come back home and you are in the time of, your, of the prayer, like you're in the time of Dhuhr, then you don't shorten it, you pray it as four and you don't combine it with Asr. But if the time has already passed, you do shorten it and you could you could combine. Well, you always have to do the tartib, right? So you always have to do the ordering. So if you let, you get back, it's six o'clock, time for Dhuhr has already passed, it's the time of Asr, you would then pray Dhuhr and Asr, and you could shorten Dhuhr the two, and then and but here's the thing, you would pray, you could pray them together, but you could only shorten the prayer of what? Dhuhr, because now it is the time of Asr, which is a four unit prayer, and you're now in your place of residence of which the four unit prayer is no longer permissible to shorten if you're in its time. So the only one you could do is Qada, is Dhuhr. You would shorten it to two, and then right after that you could go ahead and pray Asr as well, but you would have to do it as four units. Be, it, be that as it may, to answer your question, if you missed uh, a dhuhr and you missed asr and you arrive at the time of maghrib then technically yes because those are four unit prayers then you would do dhuhr asr and two units each right and then you would pray maghrib as three and then when it's time to pray isha you'd be done you just pray that normally as four and then ask Allah for forgiveness Rabbi, obviously for letting that you know go past both of its times so in other words, it would be preferable to um, to pray on the plane. Even just seated. Seat. Yeah, just seated. Yeah. yeah. That would be preferable than... If you're driving, you should pull over. <laughs> yeah, unless you're in a Tesla. You know, you got one of those... Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you trust e if you trust Elon Musk to lead the prayer. So here's the thing about praying seated. The most correct way to pray seated is actually to sit on the ground, not in a chair. I know this is weird because we, you, we every time you come to the, to the masjid, especially for Jama'ah, you see the old people sitting in chairs and they're doing this in their chairs. That is not the preferred way to do it. The preferred way to do it if you are forced, because Allah Ta'ala says, well, uh, 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 you know, if they were qiyam wa qiyam wa ala junubihim, they're either qu'ud, they're, they're, they're seated, meaning what's sitting on the ground. So you would sit like what Matt is sitting, except you would sit um, Indian style, whatever you know, with your legs crossed. So yeah, that's how 
you would actually pray seated on the ground. And then as they say, the difference between your uh, ruku' and your sujood, the difference between your bowing and your sujood is try to make the sujood a little bit further than your ruku'. That's how you would try to differentiate between the two. So you could, you know, uh, Allahu Akbar, subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would be like this, and then, you know, Sami Allahu Ibn Hamidahu, Rabbana wa alham, and then you would make your sujood to try to make it a little bit deeper than what you made your ruku'. Now, if you can't sit like that on the ground due to condition or circumstance, then, okay, you can sit in the chair. But people just by default go to the chair. The chair is even, it's like the ruqsa of the ruqsa. <laughs> it's like a dispensation of the dispensation. But yes, if you're in the plane, you're in your seat, you can't get up and pray in the aisle and all that, or alhamdulillah, like some of the Muslim airlines, like Saudi airlines and whatnot, I mean, they have like a little prayer space. But if you don't have it, it's better to do it in that fashion versus to let both both of them go and slip out, right? So do it in, in, to do it in that fashion. But yeah, that's an important thing. So when you come back home and you are arrived, you have to you have to be cognizant. Am I am I arriving with prayers that are due? Are they four unit prayers? And I are, am I arriving in or out of the time in which those prayers are to be done? And that will determine whether you still get to shorten. Or, or now you're praying as a resident. وَإِذَا نَزَرَ فِي بَلَدِهِ وَنَوَى الْإِقَامَ فِيهَا عَرْبَةَ أَيَّمْ صَحِيحَا Also, he said, if now, this is on the journey. So, if you arrive at your destination and you intend to stay there for four complete days or more, then after the fourth day, you should go and start to perform the prayer as a resident. There's a few exceptions. Right, but that's just the general statement. If you're there for more than four days, you're settled, this or that, now you should go back to performing the prayers at the regular times, unshortened and uncombined, according to the local time, right? Now, he says that, however, However, if there is a need while you're in that place, based upon you know, you're not really settled and you're going to be, there's some difficulty in being able to fulfill the prayers, then you're allowed to continue. Then you're allowed to continue to shorten and combine. But that's something that should be assessed. Now, again, there will be a difference of opinion. There are some narrations of some of the Sahabi or Tabi'een that they traveled somewhere and they stayed there for years and prayed as a traveler. But that's not, as we say, the Mu'atamid, that's not the strong reliance upon opinion. So after four days, you should assess whether or not you're pretty stable in your location. Now, let's say you're going and you keep jumping from hotel to hotel or you're staying from place to like you're not staying in the same place, uh, sleeping in the same place, jumping. Well, okay, that you know, you could say, okay, fine. I'm still kind of unstable. I'm hopping around a bunch. So I'll continue to shorten and combine my prayers. So alhamdulillah, uh, I think we're, I'll, I'll double check here. Also make sure nobody had any questions. Uh, in the Google Classroom, but I think we're all set. So, all right, well, inshallah, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, we'll be back for uh, the same two again next week, inshallah.